The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back from your extended Easter break, um, and welcome to our webinar today on cloud computing. My name's Yvette Adams, and I'm from the Creative Collective. We're very proud to be presenting this webinar today on behalf of the Queensland Government, and specifically the Department of Employment, Economic Development and Innovation, otherwise known as DEDE. Just going to flick a slide. This is what we've got in store for you today, folks. We're just going to have a quick five minutes, um, making sure that you're okay with the technology and welcome if this is your very first webinar. We can recognise some faces um, and there's always some new ones too, so welcome. I'll also introduce you to um, Dr. Paul Campbell, who's uh, our guest today on this particular session. We'll then go through some key points, and there will certainly be time for questions at the end. Now, if you have questions in between, you're welcome to put them through via the, ch the chat um, area. If they're technical, Jag, who's our facilitator today, will be there to answer you and see if he can assist you. And if there's something... Uh, specifically about the topic matter, we'll probably leave those to the end or if we can quickly answer them without any disruption to the flow, we will. So um, a quick orientation, I'd like you to click on the red arrow if you can see on your screen, which will expand the menu. From Once you click on that, you should be able to see more and then down the bottom you should see a little um, plus sign with chat and it's on there that you can text us questions. So just like MSN chat or Skype chat, uh, you can certainly drop us a line on there. So let's move on. Um, that's my face, Yvette Adams, and I'm an award-winning business owner. I've started four businesses from scratch, some of which I've been sold, um, so I hope I can share some of my experience with you today. I'm now the owner, director, and franchisor of the Creative Collective. Basically, we're a creative agency based on the Sunshine Coast of Queensland, and we work with companies all over Australia and even internationally. And funnily enough, a lot of the reason we're able to do that is because we do use cloud computing technologies, and I'm a true believer that some of the reasons we've been acknowledged with business awards along the way is for some of our more innovative use of cloud computing technologies. We're certainly very big on them, and I'll give you some really real specifics on which ones we choose to use today, not saying they're for you, but giving you some ideas on what we use and why today. Um, as you can see there, I work with lots of different types of companies, and I'm also a mother of two. Mine are aged four and seven, and at this point I always like to see if you're there and you're working out this technology okay. So if you're a parent, can you put up your hand by clicking on the little hand sign? Great, Katrina's put hers up, Aroha, Christopher, Fantastic, you're all looking very lively today, you must feel that chocolate Easter eggs firing you along. And I need to let you know that if you want to put it down, click on the hand again and down it goes. I will be asking for your feedback throughout the session today, so that's one way you can indicate that yes, it applies to me, um, and so on. So yeah, I'm really glad to be with you today training you, because I love um, sharing my knowledge and helping people uh, move on with their business, get some real business success. Now, up on the screen now, I have a pretty picture of Dr. Paul Campbell. So I'm just going to uh, unmute Paul now. And as you can see on the screen, Paul is very well qualified to join us today. He has a lot of letters after his name, which he might like to explain to us in just a moment. Um, he's been a director of several technology companies um, since 1984, so a long history in this sort of domain. And now he's the executive officer of the ICT Industry Workgroup, consulting to the government and Cognitia. And I'm just going to stop there, Paul. Can you tell us more about yourself for a moment? Thanks, Yvette. Um, I've been in the industry since the uh, early 80s. It sounds such a long time now. I've seen... Uh, the start of the CDs, the internet, etc. My first CD I ever purchased cost me $120 for a blank. <laughs> uh, I've survived all that, and I am now a uh, the executive officer for an organisation that acts on behalf of the industry in providing advisory services to the Queensland uh, government on IT policy and procurement. My uh, interest in the internet really has stemmed from the very early days. We were the first company to produce a major application for what was called MSN, which was Bill Gates' original 
plan to create a private internet. But he now uh, saw the light and six weeks before it was all to launch, he said MSN was dead and long live the internet. So uh, when I talk about those things now, I feel very old. <laughs> and you're also um, a member of several boards we can see on there um, and a fellow of the Computer Society, Society, so very active in a number of sort of community areas that have um, along the way something to do with cloud computing too, don't you? Uh, yes, the, uh, I suppose the, the interest comes from the various boards is to provide a, a perspective from a particular point of view of industry to a lot of government organisations. Um, essentially government has a different role to play. It has a much longer time frame, a much longer horizon to look at. And often that dictates their views of the world. Uh, so my role often on these boards is to provide a industry perspective, which isn't different. It's just simply a another uh, frame of reference. Sure. Well, thank you for that, Paul. So throughout the presentation, we're going to tap into Paul's um, experiences, knowledge, just to give, I guess, a different spin on some of the things I'll be sharing with you. But also at the end, he'll very much be available for questions. So if you have something arising out of something we've covered or just something you've always wanted to ask, if either Paul or myself can help you, would certainly be happy to. Are we okay with everything? Yes, just checking. Right, so if you've happened to have signed up for this webinar today and you didn't even really know what you're signing up for, but you had heard of this thing called cloud computing and thought it sounded rather interesting, here is what it is. I thought we should all get on the same page to start with. Cloud computing is a new way of delivering computing resources and not a new technology. So if you thought it's some new social network or something like that, it's something that's emerging, it's certainly not. It's just a way of accessing um, information, storing information um, and utilising services even online. So as you can see, that particular quote is from ENISA or the European Network and Information Security Agency and that little diagram there I hope gives you some idea of what the cloud is. The cloud is essentially the internet. So via your PC or desktop computer, via your laptop, via your mobile, you may well be accessing information on the internet, either loading it up or pulling it down and if you are, you're dealing with the cloud. So given that thought, you're probably actually um, using cloud computing without even realising it. So if you're looking on the screen right now, hands up if you can see looking on that screen uh, a logo you're familiar with or a service you're already using in your business. I imagine there, I'd almost expect all of you, yeah, there go a lot of the hands. Some of you, I hope, can find that little hand icon because I'd really like you to interact with me. Um, Certainly some of these are very popular and you can see there's everything on there from, you know, payment solutions like PayPal, social networks like Twitter, um, Google Docs, which we'll be going over a little bit, and, and then even uh, Windows and having these different cloud computing platforms. Okay, we're going to keep going from here. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of an organisation called Gartner, but if you go to Gartner.com, they produce uh, regularly some quite interesting reports. Sometimes they're quite out there, um, but more often than not, they tend to come true faster than they actually report. So if you just have a little breeze over some of these stats, a lot of them are related to the cloud. So by 2012, 20% of businesses will own no IT assets, so perhaps no actual servers and networks internally, maybe utilising on others. Um, 2012, India-centric services representing a lot of the market share of the cloud. Interesting sways that are going on there. Infrastructure as a service, which is one segment of the cloud, IaaS it's otherwise known as, expected to grow dramatically in the next three years. Social networking continuing to grow, more and more people continuing to transact you know, money via the mobiles or the internet, and the mobile certainly growing as well. Do you um, draw on Gartner reports ever, Paul? Uh, yes, I do. I, uh, there are two or three other companies that provide similar quality. Uh, the only, um, I suppose, hesitation I've got is that Gartner actually asks companies to pay to participate in their survey. So if you see a company that is absent from one of their uh, magic quadrant, quadrant surveys, they haven't signed up for that or paid for that particular service. 
Sure. So do you find that these come true or come true faster than they tend to predict? I think Gartner and the other big companies actually do an excellent job of showing the, uh, the life cycle of technologies, but they do often miss the, uh, the social media, the impact of social media. They're often more conservative than, in fact, the, uh, the reality of what takes place. Isn't that amazing? I mean, to me, every time I look these up, they're mind-boggling stats. But, um, yeah, even more dramatic, you reckon. That's interesting stuff. Okay, moving on to explain cloud computing and some of the benefits. Let's start with the positive stuff. So we go around the wheel, starting with the left. No desktop money. If you, you're in the business and you're wanting to save money and purchasing you know, legitimate software that you need to do your job, whether it's something like desktop publishing software such as the Adobe range, um, you know, internet software or actual um, Microsoft or any of the other type of softwares, there are actual solutions in the cloud. So you can utilize often free solutions. So something to be aware of. Um, there's also no need for software upgrades because when you access the cloud, now some cloud solutions are free and some are paid, they are usually upgrading those. Um, so rather than you know, needing to buy the next version and install it and make sure all the updates have gone through, etc., there's no need for that. So that's, again, buying you some more time as a business owner. Also, and this is pretty important given the recent disasters we've had here in Queensland, your files are not stored on your computer. Now, there were instances with the recent Brisbane floods or, or Queensland floods and the um, cyclone Yasi as well, where people had their servers and things like basements, which got flooded out. And in the turmoil of getting out of the office or maybe not even be, being able to access it be, with enough time or warning, some of that key data was lost. Do you have any comment on that one, Paul? You probably knew people affected, I imagine. Uh, I did. And some of the points that happened there, some departments lost their computing services, not because they were flooded, but because key parts of the network were flooded. In fact, they were. there were some cases where service providers had their own premises flooded, and in doing so, their clients lost computing services. And in many cases, the departments weren't aware that that was a point of failure. Isn't that interesting? And a lot of people may or may not be aware where their data is. They just trust the IT department or something like that to look after it. But certainly if you have it in the cloud, the benefit of that is technically people in Brisbane could have upped and left to somewhere safe, maybe Melbourne or Perth at that time, and continued working with no time down. And as we all know, sometimes there's deadlines and time pressures and things can um, really start becoming a snowball effect if they're not actioned on time. So, you know, even as a backup, it's certainly good, worth looking at cloud computing for an instance like that. Another one a point you can see there next around, looking at the fourth one from the left now, is all you need is an internet connection and you're away and working. So if you have uh, aspirations of going and working around the world or going on holiday, you're a small business owner who hasn't actually had a break for a while, if you want the ability to check in on how your business is performing or the data that's going through, that is possible. All you need is an internet connection via the cloud computing solutions. And I really love that. I mean, I remember going to New York, checking my bank account online, checking what invoices had been raised, checking what estimates had been raised, checking what projects, who was saying what, and even contributing my two cents worth, even though I was technically on holiday. And I like that control and ability to have a holiday, but still remain with a hand in the business. Another one, the second to last one, is you can access your documents and file from any computer or mobile phone at any time. And there's been numerous instances where I've been with a client or interstate or international and I've needed a document. Um, and some of these uh, services I'll show you in just a moment have allowed me to do that. I haven't needed my hard drive or I hadn't needed to walk around with an actual physical hard drive either. It's all on the cloud. And real-time collaboration, I really like this one. It allows us as a business to be really efficient. We work on the same documents, spreadsheets, PowerPoints, all of that sort of thing at the same time, allowing us to complete any given job quicker. So can you guys see some of the benefits for your own business? If these are some of the things cloud computing can do, raise your hand if you think some of these things could be kind of handy for what you're doing in business right now. A lot of hands there, I would have thought so. Any final comments on the benefit side, um, Dr. Paul? Yeah, I think the other um, significant benefit is that it removes the cost of obsolescence. If you own computing equipment, you essentially have equipment growing old and obsolete very quickly. By moving onto the cloud, 
that cost to your business is removed. Excellent. And I mean, in these times, we also, you know, we had an economic downturn prior to these disasters. I'm sure we're all very mindful of that. So great contribution there. All right, moving on. For some people getting their head around this concept, I like to bring up the rent versus buying argument. Now, we can generally get our head around renting versus buying houses. We all have to live in one. So if you look on the left, renting, you know, you can get something that suits you now, but you can't and the ability to change relatively easily. So for now, if you only need a one bedroom, but next minute you have children, it's pretty easy to change once the rental agreement is up. With renting, you also don't own it, but you get to benefit from the space, and someone else takes care of the upgrades, extensions, etc. And so too with this cloud computing software. So if you get something, and maybe it's a free trial to start with, or it's a very limited um, amount of service, not all the functions, as your business grows, so too can you relatively easy change, either upgrade up the scale or actually physically change whole systems, which is a, a thing I really like, that flexibility and versatility in business. Um, also, you don't own it, but you get to enjoy the, the service and someone else is taking care of all that technical stuff. So again, along the thought of uh, what Dr. Paul just mentioned before, you might be able to reduce your IT staff or actually do without them altogether because somebody else at this particular company is looking after it. Now, on the other side in the buying thing, you, you own it, but you'll also pay the price to do so. So let's say desktop software, you know, you will own it, well, technically you get the license, um, but you do have to pay quite a sum to access that. You also don't really know if it's right for you, you until you live there in a house. And so too, with the software, you don't always know if it's right for you and how long it will be right for you um, until you're using it. It's much harder to move on if your needs change and you're going to be responsible for making sure that it's getting the updates, it's being virus protected, etc. So any comments on this one, Dr. Paul? I think the... The other part about um, having to maintain upgrading uh, of software is that not only is the upgrade done for you, but it is absolutely transparent. You just stop thinking about it. You have signed up to a managed service, and once you've chosen the service provider and the level of service that you want, then everything else just becomes in the background and becomes totally transparent and no longer your problem. So that provides a huge saving in time and energy for small business. That's right. You can really just get on with it rather than having to worry about where the next software is coming from. And I must admit, I've had this argument with my accountant. You know, even for, say, account software, she said, oh, it was payroll. She said, I think you should buy it. And I think the sum was about $600 because she said whatever I was paying on a monthly basis actually worked out more. But I said, no, I actually save money because the amount of time my bookkeeper has to spend on inputting data is much less, so there's a saving. And also, um, I can change from this particular system if it doesn't work anymore. And also, for me, it worked in with my existing bank arrangements and my other accounting software it was all seamless. Whereas if I was going to get this off-the-shelf one, it was going to sit on my desktop. I wouldn't be able to travel with it and run payroll. Um, the backups would be my responsibility and so on. So there was a lot of downsides, which being an accountant, she looked at things from a different way to me. All right, why the trend towards cloud? There's a few different points on there, and I'm pretty sure Dr. Paul has some really uh, good points to add to this, but globalization. You know, people are starting to interact. I said I have global customers, and it ends up if any of you do out there as well, interstate or even international. If you do, then you know this, this trend really helps you interact with them, maybe take money in different currencies, um, maybe raise an invoice that they can action in their own time and so on. Um, economic downturns, as we've already talked about, people are looking to try and save money and decrease the IT hardware assets and even personnel. Um, the direct open communication, we've got things like social media and video streaming now, people are finding very handy. I actually saw a new funeral parlour in this area has uh, set up video conferencing, so if people can't make the actual funeral service, they can video conference in now. It's all very high tech and I thought um, very forward thinking. Uh, virtualization, so people are contracting external parties to work virtually and certainly as a company, we have around 25 contractors that are not in our office here in, on the Sunshine Coast. We've had them over time in Tokyo, Melbourne, America, New Zealand, Philippines, literally everywhere. And we all work harmoniously as a team through things like online project management softwares. And that's certainly possible for you. 
diversification, employees running personal desktops and things. Um, we certainly do that as an office as well. So my staff members, some choose to use Macs, some choose to use iPads, some choose to use um, PCs, laptops, uh, whatever they like, uh, and they're running them on our networks. Now, once upon a time, that wouldn't have been okay because of viruses and things like that, but uh, we're, we're fine with that if they prefer to use that and it means they're more effective and happier working. There's also simplification, reviewing core business processes, and this is something I suggest any small business does, is really think about from start to finish, where do you source your customers from, uh, what happens once they come to you, what systems do they go through, is it you know, quoting systems, is it account systems, is it project management systems, and how can you improve those efficiencies. You can actually really review that and streamline those through some cloud computing softwares. Gee, it can make a huge difference on your business. And the last two, mobilization. If you're looking for lifestyle, and that's something I always seek in my business, um, being able to work from home or work on holiday and, and be able to actually have that holiday, um, to travel for business and still not get too far behind because you're actually out of the office, and even nice green things like reducing the carbon footprint, well, all this uh, cloud computing stuff certainly does that too, and then collaborating. You know, we work on these projects, like I said, any given project, and we may add a web developer from Melbourne and a graphic designer from New Zealand and a project manager from our team here on the Sunshine Coast, and we're all coming together to work on, on this given project. So um, anything else to add to the trend or comments on any of those ones I've just mentioned, Dr. Paul? Yeah, I'd say the other major advantage of a true cloud service provider is that your processing power and storage are completely dynamic. You can, if you're running a particular project that's going to need additional store, um, computing power for a week or so or a day or even for five minutes, a true cloud supplier can provide that computing power instantly and charge you by the second so that you don't have to invest in additional equipment for short-term uh, projects. Sure, that's great, and um, it's certainly something that, you know, our businesses change all the time, don't they, and they certainly should. I think if anyone isn't innovating constantly, they're going to become pretty stagnant and um, perhaps not keep up with the race and, and fall out of it. So with all of this in mind, this is all sounding very positive at this stage, but you really need to take action as a business owner can, of your own destiny and really consider your business needs when it comes to cloud. Now, a workbook was uploaded, it was not long before Easter, and you may or may not have had time to look through that, depending on whether you worked through Easter diligently or actually had a well-deserved break. But either way, we do encourage you to download the workbook which comes along with this webinar so that you can give some of this some more consideration because there's some very helpful exercises in there. But specifically, you need to think about reliability. If you're going to use cloud, how important is it that it's really reliable for you? I imagine for most businesses it's extremely important. Um, but Dr. Paul, you were just saying uh, over the weekend, even someone like Amazon, who's usually very reliable, fell down a little bit. Amazon had probably the major, the, the largest crash of a large commercial cloud provider that we've seen to date. So their um, what's called Amazon Web Services uh, was down for several days and affected people around the world. And what's interesting was they don't know what caused the problem, but they essentially triggered their own internal software to start a, a denial of service attack on itself. So the problem was internal rather than external and because it was so complex it took the engineers several days to bring it under control. So they didn't get an Easter break. <laughs> no, they certainly didn't. <laughs> they have to keep their jobs. Yeah, sure. Gosh, them's the breaks when you're in that space I guess though. Look, the other one you can see up there is growth. So as a business owner you need to think about what stage you're at in business and I really like cloud actually for many stages. I like them, I just cut out so I'm just rolling again. I was just talking about growth and as a business startups this really suits them because sometimes you don't know if this business is going to be a goer. You don't know how fast it will grow. So you know utilizing a cloud computing system which Dr. Paul's already alerted to, alluded to I should say, um, you can get a solution and then as 
perhaps your business takes off, and I certainly hope it does, you can just upgrade the packages, or if the current service isn't suiting, jump ship altogether, and there's often you know, several available that do similar things. So give yourself that you know, question, how fast are you growing at the moment? Privacy, now some of you, who deals with really highly sensitive data? Maybe you're a lawyer or in the medical space, anyone want to raise their hand because what they're dealing with is really something they don't want other people to see. That's certainly something to consider pretty carefully um, because although data is um, kept under username and password, there's some issues around that, isn't there, Dr. Paul? There is, and in fact, some of it is at a government level. Uh, most of the large cloud service providers are American, and the American government has something called the Patriot Act, which basically says that if you're an American company, irrespective of where your data is stored anywhere in the world, you must hand it over to the American government on demand. And that's something to do with the um, Terrorism Act, isn't it? It's mainly if they think that that's there's correct. maybe terrorist activity going on. But even so, yeah, this is a huge issue for particularly government agencies, which I imagine you're consulting on, is whether they can feel comfortable sharing that data if they're technically sharing it with American government officials. Well, they're actually, by law, they cannot do it. So what they have to do is, in terms of Australian governments, they have to set up a similar cloud offering within Australia. It's got to have, they've got to have sovereign control of their data. Sure, and that's something that's in progress but not quite established if I'm correct in my thinking, is that right? That's correct. There's a lot of discussion around how such a service might operate across the various uh, governments, both state and federal, but to date there isn't a service available. Sure, so watch the space. I mean, this is how new and cutting edge this webinar really is because even the government is still finding its feet there and uh, working out yeah, how it is going to store this data. So there is a, a local, if you like, solution. Now, security as well. You need to consider, are you a potential target for hacking? Could it be a competitor? Could it just be someone doing it for fun? And are they more likely to hack your, I don't know, network or server that you're locally keeping, maybe currently? Or is it going to actually be safer? And, and what sort of security measures do this particular cloud computing solution you're looking into have. Budget as well, what do you allocate to IT right now and how important is it to your business success? Could you be making some cost savings and if so, um, what are the perhaps functions it will have or, or not have if you move? Um, also, what are your needs in business? And this is a question you should be asking yourself regularly because your needs do change. Is it productivity you're shooting for? a CRM, which stands for Client Relationship Manager? Are you trying to improve your marketing or financial efficiency? Well, there are cloud computing solutions for all of these. And again, we go into them more in depth in the workbook, but uh, depending on which solution is right for you will really depend on what your needs are. I can't say there's this one marketing solution that will suit all of you, um, because it really depends very much on your needs. Um, finally, resources. So do you have an in-house IT team, an external contractor or not? Will you ever have one? So, you know, do you need someone to help you set up these cloud solutions and then you'll be all right on your own? Do you need someone to sort of be there in case you do need support and going through or perhaps your staff need training? Um, or is this actually the reason you're moving to cloud that you eliminate the need for setup and ongoing use? It really, again, depends on your skills, your experience, your time availability and a number of other factors. Are there any other business needs that you think need to be considered, Dr. Paul, if these people on this call today are thinking about actually getting into the cloud? I think you can start off simply by looking at the security issues of having remote data storage. And there are suppliers, several suppliers now who are offering free remote data storage of you know, up to five gigabytes for absolutely no cost to you. So, Understanding how to manage data uh, that, yeah, in a remote um, data center is useful. Then how to use collaboration and synchronizing that. And then finally you can move to running remote processes or remote programs or applications. So you don't have to take this as an all or nothing situation. You can just start at the simple part of storing your data somewhere else and then move through the different levels as you become more confident. 
And that's a really good point and certainly something we as a business did. I think one of the first things we did in the cloud was back up our data. And I think um, the second thing we did was start raising estimates and invoices from there and we continued to use uh, MyOB at that stage. Now we actually have chosen to use Xero, um, which is one of many accounts uh, solutions and that's now everything is in the cloud and we also use an online project management system, online payroll system, etc. But yeah, like you say, we didn't do it all at once, it would be far too much to take on. A lot of these systems you can customise, a lot of them we had to research as to their suitability to us. So if you, I guess, work through your priority um, needs as a business, perhaps like I said, if it's financial efficiency you're really looking at, um, looking at what could be done there. I'd almost say for many of you though, it probably is the backup and storage data that's a really good one to start with. I do want to introduce you to on this call Google Apps and look, it's one of the, it's not the only thing out there in the cloud, I want you to know that straight off, but it is one that we've chosen to use quite a lot and it is one that does come up in business quite a lot at the moment and some of you may well be using some Google solutions already. So could I see a show of hands of those of you who are already using Google Apps, maybe Google Calendar or Google Docs or Google Mail, it's quite a few of them. A few hands up there but still going up. Quite keen to see what percentage. I reckon we've got about a third of you on that, that's pretty interesting. All right, let's move on. Now I'm not going to go into all of these in depth, we don't have the time, um, but I am going to just introduce you to a couple. Actually, by the way, Dr. Paul, do you use Google Apps and what do you think of them as a general statement? I do use Google Apps. I think uh, as a free service, they are amazingly comprehensive and sophisticated and they can certainly get you into a, uh, a useful website and all the associated services around that um, at virtually no cost. Which we love that, don't we, right? No cost. I mean, that's wonderful. Now, starting off with Google Mail. So if you use Outlook at the moment or Thunderbird or any other sort of uh, email program, maybe even use Hotmail, Google Mail is that. It's an email service program. Now, here's the big kicker. 25 gigabytes per employee for Gmail is available and backed up for free. That's a huge amount of data and over time they've upped it and upped it, haven't they Dr. Paul? It started off one gigabyte or something and now 25 gigabytes is up there with I think as much as anybody else offers. Is, is that correct? That's correct and in fact uh, I know from personal experience it takes a lot of years to fill 25 gigabytes of mail storage. So do you know actually where they stored their data? Is it it's somewhere in America presumably? Uh, they do have data centers around the world, but they are building new data centers in the States as we talk. Their own um, network plan for Google is looking at a number of servers that they intend to have of over 10,000, uh, sorry, I'm saying a lie, over 1 million data, uh, data servers. So they are truly in the cloud. Um, if you put things into Google, you would not know where in the world that particular piece of information is being stored. So there's a pro and the con there. I mean, it's, as you can see from the list on the screen, there's some fantastic features. But the downside is that, like you said, you don't necessarily know where it's being stored and who may or may not have access to it in the future. So it depends really, I guess, on the data you're dealing with and your comfort levels as well. But Quickly running through some of these features, powerful spam filter, I must say when I made the transition to Google Mail or Gmail as it's more commonly known, I noticed a dramatic decrease in spam and I'm sure you all hate spam, anyone want to raise a hand if they're not that into all the spam they get and they're looking for a solution to reduce it, Google Mail is something to look at with that in mind. Built in instant messaging has that, voice and video chat, sure you can use Skype but there is a Google chat solution as well. It's got a drag and drop label system which I really like so I can code what sort of data is going through there, perhaps a certain project or a certain person it's coming from, maybe it's even a certain e-newsletter I get regularly, I can give it a label and it clearly comes up as such. It's quite good that you can turn an email into a Google Doc so if you are going to get into the Google Apps that's possible. You can work offline so I'll sometimes say sit on an um, aeroplane working offline on my Google Mail get to my destination, reconnect with internet and all those emails go out which I love. 
Um, it's very compatible with iPhones, BlackBerry, and it can work in with Outlook as well. You can sync it. And you can actually run, a lot of people don't realize this, whatever your domain name is, um, for instance ours, the Creative Collective, we can run at the creativecollective.com.au emails via the system. So it might look like it's coming from Outlook or something like that. It's actually going via Gmail. So um, I had used Outlook ever since the late 1990s, and I'd always loved it inside and out. But it was only about 12 months ago I made the switch to Gmail. And um, the main reason I did was because I got so much email, I was finding I was hitting about 4 gigabytes of data every 3 or 4 months. And I found Outlook was just grinding really slow. And I really like the search function actually in Google Mail too, because Google are very good for search. So I could type, type one word of a person, or, or a word I knew was in the email, and it would instantly retrieve it for me. So I found it pretty useful for that. Do you have any um, comment on Google Mail yourself, Dr. Paul? Uh, I think your point about being able to personalize it for individual company names is an important one. You don't have to just be you know, Paul Campbell at Gmail. I am Paul Campbell at my company name, Cogentia, and yet that just goes straight through Gmail. Uh, very easy to set up and looks as professional as uh, any other company. So you can see I've got a screenshot up just while Dr. Paul was talking then that not only can you personalize it in that way, you can even personalize it and have, I've got a bit of a water feature going on behind there so you can wake up and change the picture which is kind of fun. They've got this priority inbox as well where you can actually over time train it by putting pluses if a certain message is an important message or minus if it's really not that important. So you can start looking at your priority inbox and over time it will come to know what you deem important emails. And the star thing, I use that as a to-do. If there's an action I need to act on, I will star it. And here you can see some of these labels going on. So really easy, um, I think, to change some of these things, whereas I used to set up rules and filters in Outlook and it's just a little bit more clunky to get there. I also really like the uh, auto response to set up for vacations. Very, very easy. So who thinks they might look into Gmail now that they've seen some of the things it can do? A few hands going up. So all we're saying is look into it, not saying you should definitely move over. Look into it and see if you like it. And you know what? A lot of the stuff is personal. You may just not like it because it just doesn't suit your personality. But um, do give it a good shot too. You know, you need to realize there will be a transition trying new software of any kind. Moving on the Google App Selection, we've got Google Calendar. So this one automatically manages invites and RSVPs for events. You can share whole calendars company-wide or with specific people. You can have multiple calendars, and I certainly do. I have a sort of home family one and then um, one for my business life. You can make these calendars public, private, or shared. So look, being public might be fine for, say, an osteopath who wants to display what bookings they've got available. And they may not say that they're seeing Mrs. Smith at 9 a.m., but they may say they're busy at that time and display that they've actually got appointments further on in the rest of the day. I like the fact I can view calendars that belong to other people. We share them internally as a team. We share them with our contractors. We often share them with people we do a lot of business with just to know when are we going most likely to be able to get them on the phone or set up a meeting without this back and forth you know, phone and email thing that can drag on. It's really easy to set up calendar appointments. Um, you can also get up scheduling ones where it's like a recurring thing. You can invite other people and you can also sync your calendar with your mobile and or Outlook. So look, for a while there I had my Outlook calendar and my Google calendar and my mobile one all syncing between. So if I was out and about and put in an appointment, my PA would see on my Gmail and Outlook, sorry, my Google calendar that there was now an appointment. Um, do any comments on Google calendar for you, Dr. Campbell? Uh, no, I suppose I agree with that. I think what I should say, though, is that where this is going with uh, Google and with Apple is that the operating systems that you're now getting on the mobile phones, the uh, Android and the uh, iOS, uh, iOS with the uh, iPhones, they're becoming, uh, in the next generation of um, laptops, they're going to be the same operating system on your laptops and your desktop computers. So. The idea of having to synchronize and all that essentially goes away because it is exactly the same operating system and it's the same piece of data. It's just simply being displayed on different devices. So the whole concept of instant on and never losing information regardless of what device you're using um, will become very real. 
Thanks for that point. Good point again. And could I just see a show of hands of those of you who are already um, actually already using Google Calendar out of interest? A few of you are. A few of you could also perhaps look into this. So on these next couple of screens, this is what it looks like. Um, you can search for calendars or find public calendars. Uh, you can easily create an event just by clicking here and you can add calendars to your personal calendar. So if you wanted to know when the library closings are or the phases of the moon or school holidays, you can actually pull those up and it will just populate rather than, say, entering all the Australian public holidays for the year, which is pretty handy. To take it a step further and show you in a visual field, this is a view of our calendar on just a chosen day. And as you can see, it's color-coded. So my particular calendar is orange. Uh, a franchisee of mine is this lighter orange. A blue one is a program I was uh, working on. So what was great about this is that the project coordinator for that program set up that independently, shared that with us, and then all those dates populated. Then if any uh, venue changed or time changed, she would update it and it would automatically display in my calendar without her having to coordinate when I was free and me to find out what was going on at her end. Saves an enormous amount of time. Here we've got a list of everyone from internal staff to um, external contractors, a brown one, Australian holidays, and so on. So you can see it looks quite busy, but it's certainly good to know where everyone's at if you're trying to schedule a meeting or something like that. And even on a personal front, this is a wonderful tool just for busy families um, or even coordinating with your partner when you might be able to get a dinner out with them depending on their schedule. Any further comments there, Dr. Paul? No, I agree with all that. Great. Google Docs is another one. Hands up if you're already using Google Docs. Dennis's, Gemma's, Gerard, JJ, Ben, Anne-Marie. Great. Not as many of you, which is interesting. So this is an interesting one because if you are not sure about Microsoft, you're wondering if you need to buy the next version, Google Docs, you can get it. You can get it for free and it will let you do Word documents or docu things that are like Word, spreadsheets, presentations. It allows you to do quite a lot. Also allows you to save them in folders, share and collaborate them, and that's something that Word doesn't let you do. So literally you can have a document open, another staff member can be in there adding their two cents worth as well, which can be pretty handy. Um, I love the autosave function because how many times do we forget to save and then we have a crash and, and lose it? It does that quite regularly once you've saved for the first time. And you can also upload emails and Microsoft documents straight into Google Docs for editing. Just going to move along. This is what a uh, typical Google Documents could look like. So we can see the green uh, spreadsheets, the blue uh, Word Docs, and uh, then we've even got these folders here. I've just blocked out a few more sensitive items. So with any given document, you can see I've got a GE Women's Network speaking. You can see, whoopsie, um, who, who's had it shared with them. So your view will show anything that you have created or uh, been given access to and you can then give access to people internal in your organization or people externally. So certainly to complete this contract to deliver webinars for the Queensland Government, we shared some documents in this way that they were able to contribute to as well. Anything further to add on the Google Documents front, Dr. Paul, in the way you perhaps use it? Uh, no, but I would say that Google are putting most of their effort into extending um, Google Docs and making it more comprehensive and more sophisticated because in the short well, short to midterm this will they want it to be a complete answer to Microsoft Office so whatever feature you think is missing out of Google Docs I wouldn't be surprised if you find that it turns up within uh, you know two three six months Brilliant, that's exciting news. And another thing I really love just here where my cursor is, is the um, search function again. You know, Google's roots are in search and you could go looking through your file explorer and you'll get the little, uh, what you call it, uh, hourglass searching as it ticks through trying to find the document. I do find in Google Docs it, it locates, if you can get a word from the title right or a word within the document, locates things very, very quickly, which is always handy for getting on with it. This is a view of Google Docs, just in case you're thinking, oh, well, you know, how different is it from Microsoft Word? 
as you can see there, it's very similar in the um, function or, or look of it. Editing tools are very similar. It automatically saves as you make changes, which is pretty good. And then once you're done, or even during, you can share that. And that's a function that Microsoft certainly doesn't have. Um, and that's one of its key features. All right, moving on in the interest of time, so we make sure we get time for these questions. Storage backup file sharing. We've already heard things like disasters. You just need this. But even you know, if you don't have these natural disasters, you can have internal disasters where something gets spilled on the hard drive, or a hard drive just blows up, or a theft occurs. And you know, don't think that you've got your trusty backup hard drive because they can get thieved at the same time as the hard drive or, or laptop. I've certainly had a friend that that happened to, and she was most disturbed about losing all their family photos. But if you want to be extra safe, I would certainly recommend you are getting some of this into the cloud. And on the screen, you can see a few um, options for you. Any of those that you choose to use, Dr. Paul? Um, my, the ones that I uh, tend to use are Flickr, Facebook, and YouTube. I mean, it's one thing to store files for backup, and certainly you know, all the ones you've listed there uh, do that. But some of these other social media sites actually do a good job as well and have the extra benefit in, in that the files become visible to people that you choose to show them to uh, as well. So there are lots of options out there to, to save data and to, um, and to create a safe vault for it that aren't necessarily just a matter of transferring a file from one place to another all the time. Sure, and actually I'd be curious of, of the participants on the call today, could you text chat in um, any of the file sharing storage or backup solutions you're using? Just drop us a line so we can see which of these you use or perhaps any others and we'll be happy to share some of those with you. Um, personally, we use um, Dropbox quite a lot. Um, what we like about that one is that you can store it on your desktop and what I'll often do is drag files across from my hard drive before I go away um, out of the office and then I have access to those easily. Also you can co-collaborate on those too so other people can send their most updated version onto there so it's quite a nice uh, backup system. File drop is not a bad one if you've got big files so often we'll have say large scale photos or pictures and we'll just want to get them to the media or, or clients for a proof and they, if we upload them to there, they can then download them at their end without them being sent via email, because usually anything over 10 megabytes, and it will just get jammed in the server. So are we getting a few text responses in? Perhaps people haven't found that. I'm going to look up the questions and see if we have. Okay, we've got Mark Skinner saying we use Dropbox extensively. You send it .com, which Liz, I used to also use that quite a lot. I've found since Dropbox and File Dropper having bigger capacity, but that's not a bad one. iPhone, Dropbox, what else have we got here? Dropbox, Dropbox and Evernote, SugarSync, Flickr, FileServe.com is one that Jags just pulled up for me, and RapidShare is yet another one. There's certainly a lot, and that's what I love about these webinars. We get to all um, share these. I would actually suggest, though, that uh, you do involve a suitably qualified IT professional to perhaps advise and set up your cloud computing solutions, perhaps in all areas or even some, because they may well know of others. They may well know your current setup. They may well, for instance, know of how much data you're carrying. I know we looked at iDrive and we started setting it up to automatically upload everything on our hard drive at a regular rotor, but then we started getting quite large bills because we realised we actually had quite a lot of data and that one wasn't going to suit us. So if you're not sure of that, um, that's something you can look into. Right, moving on, finance and accounting systems in the cloud. Once again, hands up if you are using one of these on screen at the moment. And if you could just text us in which one you're using, and maybe it's another one, in the area of finance and accounting solutions. So I don't know if any of you have had this problem where you've kind of been working on your accounting files or your bookkeeper has, and you have to zip it up, and you have to send it off to the accountant, and you have to then wait until they get it back to you. And you can lose a lot of work and key data if for any reason the file is lost or corrupt. We... Um, we used to use Myob, we quite happily use Myob, and the accountants certainly like that one, it's very well used in Australia, but we moved on to two on there, FreshBooks and Xero, and the reason we chose those two for our business, and I certainly encourage you to look into all of them, is that at the time Myob didn't have live accounts, that is now available, um, 
and FreshBooks we found suited our estimating and our invoices really well and it's got an automated follow up and the ability to pay online which we loved but it's Canadian and it didn't fulfill our tax, local tax uh, requirements. So we then got zero. these two working together so we can suck in all the data with not very much data entry involved and this one actually records all our GST, BAS etc. So we're able to do our quarterly BAS without too much time and effort. So that's why we do that one. Um, I'll see if anyone's got some suggestions here. Actually, I'm going to expand that. It might be easier to see. Someone's saying carbonite actually was another. Okay, here we go. FreshBooks and Zero. How is their support? Tell you what, FreshBooks forum support is excellent. Zero, not so fast. Uh, QuickBooks and Myob, a bit slow in the cloud I've found. That's good feedback from Aroha. Zero and Sasu. Sasu is certainly one I would have a look at. It's got some very good introduction ones if you just want to test it out and you're quite a small business or quite early phases of your business and it's got some nice point of sale things as well. Someone else has suggested NetSuite, Sasu, JJ suggests and loves it. Zero, fresh books and looking at zero now, zero came up again. So that's interesting. Everyone's using uh, different bits and pieces on there. Have you had any experience with the online account systems, Paul? Yes, I use uh, QuickBooks for a uh, professional association that I'm involved in. Um, the big advantage of going online with the accounting was that each year when we change our committee, we didn't have to send a computer and, uh, and all the documentation to another state of Australia. We were able to keep our accounts in one place and just provide the, uh, the password and a bit of training to the new treasurer and that has worked extremely well for us. That's always an issue, isn't it, with our committees and things, so that's a really good point there. Um, look, there are many more systems and I couldn't possibly fit them in today's session, so I've just, I guess, introduced you to a few that I think are going to be of general uh, interest, such as the online storage, the Google Apps and the financial ones we've just seen. But look, in your business you may need a project management system. You may need a client relationship management system, otherwise known as a CRM. In fact, I think every business should have one of those. A company wiki where you store key documents or like your operations manual or templates, get them off the hard drive and online so everyone can access them. You may need a content management system to administrate your website. You may need communication systems in the cloud for e-marketing or sending out e-newsletters or doing uh, bulk text messages out for a marketing promotion or even Skype as well. Have you got any other suggestions, Paul, on additional cloud technology which could be on that list? Because there really is a lot out there, isn't there? There is, but I did want to emphasise what you said before about uh, running a, a wiki for uh, internal documents and documents that you want to share with your clients. They might be manuals, they could be policies. Uh, that's, I think, an area that a lot of people don't think about and yet it's very easy to do and saves an enormous amount of time and effort and cost if you've got a, a dynamic document uh, sitting on the web. We've certainly found it's useful and I mean it's taken double the time to create every document because every time you do a task you have to write the instructions on how to do it but down the track it certainly saved us time because staff are able to get up and running quicker and when you come to do a job and it's been a while you've got that great um, guidance sitting right there in front of you. Look, we've talked a lot about some very positive aspects of the cloud, but we do want to point out today as well that it's not for everyone. We've already sort of highlighted that data is often stored offshore and as, as such falls under their jurisdiction. For example, uh, if it's in an American server, you're subject to the Patriot Act. You need to ask yourself, is this okay with me or not? You also need to be aware that this whole cloud thing is relatively new though it is going at quite a pace. So you need to decide, I guess, at what point you want to jump on this very fast moving train, if at all. Um, you need to do your due diligence. Where is your data stored currently? What recovery plans do you have? Or sorry, even for the particular one you're looking at using, what support do they have? How many others use it? Um, a lot of these will openly publish this on their support pages. Others you might have to go looking for a little bit deeper. And you really should have a company policy in place related to all your cloud computing or even just hardware, software, technology. Because what if a staff member leaves, like Paul was saying with the committees? What if a staff member is accessing IP and sharing it, say the wikis um, or other sensitive 
accounts information. So you need to have um, a policy as to who accesses it, who has the usernames, what happens when someone leaves, perhaps you have a policy that you change all the usernames and passwords across the board. And for further information on things to be aware of, there is a draft Australian Government Cloud Computing Direction paper which you can find on that link. Anything else to add on the, um, I guess, caution side of things, Paul? I'd say two points. One is give some thought to setting up a, uh, a cloud in two parts. One that has private and confidential information on it, where you restrict um, access and screw that access right down so that that will meet your privacy obligations and your legal obligations. And then run a separate part of the cloud for general access by staff and maybe clients. It's actually easier to keep those two things separate than it is to try and manage passwords and security levels, I've found. I suppose the other point is you need to think about what happens if I lose access to the cloud for an hour, a day or a week and think about what is your strategy for business continuity. You can certainly have a great deal of confidence in the professionalism of the big companies offering cloud computing, but there's still a network involved, there's still underseas cables that can get broken. There are a range of communication devices sitting between you and your data, and they can all have faults. So you do need to think about how will my, data, how will my company survive if I lose access so don't be complacent just because you've got confidence in the supplier of the cloud as opposed to the connections to the cloud. Really good points there and that just brings us so nicely onto the next slide was is that backups are still necessary. So you know even someone like Gmail on 27th of February this year 0.02% of their users lost their accounts. Now whilst that sounds like a very small number a lot of people use Gmail and a lot of people were very upset. So um, they did rectify it very quickly within a couple of days, but if you couldn't have done without that data for a couple of days, did you have the offline version, did you have some sort of uh, backup system in place? Also, um, last year Google reported that it had a bug in Google Docs, it affected only some. So you know, even things like Facebook, as we showed in the social media session we did not long ago, and there is a recording available of that. If you were uh, worried about the data on there, it's a good practice to get into to download all that data every now and then so you have a copy because what say a legal issue arose and you needed access to that and suddenly it wasn't available. It's just good practice to keep um, all of that uh, somewhere and I wouldn't keep it like the cartoon suggests on the sticky notes because that would be a bit ludicrous. Anything else to add on, on backups, um, Paul? Yes, I'd say you need to be cautious about companies that are offering deals and say we're on the cloud because a lot of companies are simply taking the word and using it to whatever service they offer. And you've got to think about whether the company is in a business sense going to be around long enough to supply you the services that you're looking for. I don't like supporting large companies for the sake of supporting a large company but I would be very cautious about a small startup company um, being the supplier of the services you're looking for. It's also interesting that we have yet to have one of these cloud suppliers, the small ones, um, go into bankruptcy or some sort of administration because if they do, the administrators can have a totally different view on the world in terms of both their legal, uh, their legal rights and also their view of you know, what obligations they have to existing clients. So it'll be an interesting day when one of these cloud um, suppliers actually goes into administration, purely because of, of, of all business activity. Sure, really good point there. Um, we are going to have to wrap up, and I'm conscious we're just a little bit over time. We haven't actually run the session before, so it's sort of hard to know where it will take us. But this is the last slide and then I'd like to give you the opportunity to ask questions. Some of you have already texted in questions and there's quite a few there. I actually would encourage you while I'm going over these points to text us in questions if you have any and Paul and I will do our very best to get back to you here. And if any of you have to go, we understand that. If you can stay on a little longer, we'd love you to. Um, cloud computing summary. So today we've talked about that you need to consider your business needs. What process or functions 
Uh, are you trying to streamline? What's your budget? What resources do you have? There are great exercises in the workbook for the session uh, that have been sent to you. Download that, print it out, start working through it, and that should help. Also consider whether cloud computing is right for your business. What about the security issues, the reliability, how are you going to handle the transition? You know, are you going to schedule that in? Who's going to assist with the transition? As people leave, actually I'm seeing a few are taking the opportunity to jump off. There is a survey which I might get uh, Jag to send through so you can give us your feedback before you hop off um, on today's session. Back to these notes, you need to do your due diligence um, and like we've said, what's the track record, what's the suitability and so on and that backups are still necessary. So um, I have a bunch of questions sitting here um, but you can also put up your hand if you want to ask it live on the call. So I'm just going to start with some of these written typed in questions and in between raise your hand if you would like to ask myself or Paul a question. We'd be more than happy to try and help you. All right, um, I've got one from Casey Lightbody saying, any suggestions on cloud-based graphic design software to mirror Adobe software like InDesign and Illustrator? Well, Casey, I'm in that space. I'm not aware of any. They're pretty complex programs, and I guess it would be nice if there were free ones because they're quite expensive too. I'm not aware of any. Are you, Paul? Uh, yes, I am. Only by um, my, uh, I recall that my graphic design studio we're talking about some open source, source tools that were attempting to provide similar um, apps to Photoshop, Illustrator, etc. They certainly weren't as sophisticated, but they definitely existed. Did we lose Paul then? I'm sorry, I'm oh. here. Oh no, that's all right. That's great. You finished. I'm sorry. I just thought um, you might have cut out then. Okay, so what were they called, did you say? No, I, honestly, I can't tell you the name. I just recall my graphic designers talking about them and saying that they were available. Okay. And they were available uh, online. Maybe, Casey, a simple Google search of um, InDesign cloud version or something like that might work, or, or graphic design or desktop publishing or something. Um, someone else has said, in regards to project management software, I've been using Huddle, and it's a very resourceful tool. So thanks, Keegan, for sharing that. Um, and Keegan has also said another great tool is Salesforce. I'd have to agree that's a great CRM system, um, very extensive, not on the cheap side, but very, very good as well. Um, Vicki Johnson has asked, examples of project management ones, please, to coordinate staff and allocate tasks. Gee, Vicki, there are just so many out there. Um, there's Solve 360, there's Workflow, etc. there's Basecamp. Um, I can think of several others. But they all vary in price and depends really what you want to do with it. Um, I know we use Basecamp. It suits us and what we're doing. Um, any other suggestions on that front project management solutions, Paul? I'd suggest that you also look at mind mapping applications. Often when people say they want project management, they find that the tools are too heavy and it takes longer to set up the project than it does to actually finish the project. And often uh, mind mapping uh, software does a good job of helping you plan the project and get to your thinking and can be used as a very lightweight project management tool on the way through. Sure. Um, Christopher has asked, are cloud costs coming down as it seems to be expensive for large data backup requirements? I might get you to answer that one, Paul. Uh, it is. It's commercially um, competitive. Uh, what you are finding is that the large companies, Amazon, uh, Google, Microsoft, are all offering free services in order to keep people uh, into their sphere of influence. Amazon have an interesting one at the moment. They offer five gigabytes of data storage for free. But if you buy a uh, any of their music um, tracks off their store and you live in America, you get an instant doubling of your, I think it's doubling, of your um, data storage capacity just because you can store your music tracks in the cloud on their service. Wow, how about that, huh? Um, so, so, yeah. so, sorry, go ahead. No, so, so you, buy one, you buy one track of music and you get an extra five gigabytes free. Excellent. That Dropbox does something a little bit similar. We um, invite people and they give you an extra 
250 megabytes for every person you invite, so it's certainly worthwhile sharing the love, so to speak, and benefiting along the way as well. Um, Kylie Welsh has asked, can you store webinars and Camtasia training videos on Google Apps, or should we consider Amazon? I would probably personally look at YouTube for that kind of thing, Kylie. Um, Paul, what would you think would be suitable? Yes, I'd go for YouTube, um, or, and Facebook for that matter, but I think YouTube does offers the best service there, and you can, uh, uh, yeah, a, a lot of companies are doing just that. Uh, using YouTube, um, setting up corporate uh, uh, corporate videos and webinars on it. And that may be something you looked into, Kylie, earlier and wasn't suitable but because of the um, limits, but now you'll find if you've been using YouTube quite a lot, you may find your limit has been lifted, and if it hasn't, you may want to look into some of their help files on what to do to get that limit lifted, because I know ours has certainly been, and we upload some pretty chunky files to there these days. Um, Vicky's also asked, can a CRM, i.e. business catalyst, speak to a project management system? If so, which one? Well, Business Catalyst is not specifically a CRM, it's actually more a CMS um, with a CRM in it. So does it speak to a project management system? You'd have to go looking on the help files of Business Catalyst for an answer to that. I imagine it may not because, as I said, it's more a CMS than a CRM. If you're really looking for a CRM that's going to talk to a project management system, I'd be looking at some of the cloud computing solutions that are purely just that. Um, for instance, I know Salesforce um, talks to a number of project management systems, as does um, Workflow, etc., for example. Um, looks like Ross Graham's question got answered by Paul um, and when he asked about Max. Uh, what else? Do you have an idea of cost? Peter Kerry asked. Peter, I don't know though which uh, question you're asking about cost, so put your hand up if you'd still like to ask that. Yep, he's got his hand up. So I might just unmute you, Peter, and see how we go. Can you hear us okay, Peter? Uh, yes, it's fine. Um, so you were asking about costs. Was there something specifically related to costs you wanted to ask? Well, I guess from, from my point of view, something in the marketing area, um, I, I need to say first up that uh, it gave a great insight into a subject that I had very, very limited, limited knowledge. Um, so if one was looking at, at using, utilizing um, various marketing aspects, can you give me a ballpark figure as to um, the, the costs involved or... Um, it's a really difficult question. I, you'd need to be much more specific. For example, if you're saying marketing, let's say you're saying e-marketing, um, there are a range of solutions and they all vary. Some, for instance, depend on the number of uh, contacts you have on their database, the number of times you contact those, da those people on the database. Um, so let's say if you have 10,000 contacts, different solutions will charge you a different amount. Some will let you send unlimited promotions, so you could send them 10 a month or as many as you like. Some will only let you send a couple and then you'll go over your data. So I guess you need to look at your database size, yeah. how frequently you're looking to contact them, some of the features and functions you're looking for. So do you want yeah. the email templates or do you want the ability to sell from them and all these kinds of things and then you could start looking at solutions. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh... Okay, no problem. I'll just mute you again and see if we can get through a few more questions before we close this off. Um, what's the current uptake of cloud computing by SME, says Alan Burrell. I might get you to answer that as well, Paul. Have you got any idea on stats? I think that's, uh, there's two answers to that question. The number of SMEs that are using formal cloud computing services, in other words, they're paying uh, for corporate type solutions. Uh, is small because the pricing models that are currently in place really aren't designed for small companies. But the number of companies that are using the free services that are available on the net, say from Google or from Microsoft or from Amazon, uh, is growing dramatically uh, because they literally are free. Um, the Google services, if you just use their basic tools, um, there's no cost. Uh, you can, if you want to, go into their corporate um, uh, solutions. In other words, have a lot more emails for your staff and things like that, or email accounts that you pay for. But even those costs are relatively small and they're incremental. So 
the two answers are low level use of the uh, of the cloud I think is actually higher much higher than people realize but the access to paid services uh, really hasn't come down to the small end of business yet Sure, thanks for that great contribution again. Look, there's a few more. I'm determined to get through. I think we've got about three or four more questions, so let's motor on. Um, Kylie Welsh wants to know, how do I access the downloadable form you mentioned? That form would be the workbook I think you're alluding to. She's saying she's not yet received the document. What's that? The survey? No. Oh, okay, if you're talking about the survey, that link has been set via chat and you'll be emailed it again tomorrow reminding you. If it's talking about the workbook, it's on the website smallbusinesswebinars.com.au. We'll also email it out to you tomorrow just to make sure everyone's got it because uh, it was right before uh, Easter that a link to that was sent out. Right. Martin Green says, Huddle or Hubble? I haven't used it, but I know it's Huddle, that uh, some kind of project management system someone else alluded to. Sandy McDonald says, is there a Google app which can handle MS Access forms? Um, I know there's Google Forms. I don't know about handling MS Access. Do you know the answer to that, Paul? Uh, I believe that um, there are translators for that online. So how well they work, I don't know. The problem is often with Microsoft products is that there are multiple ways of getting to the same uh, endpoint and some of the translators don't cover all of those possibilities. But my understanding is that there are um, translators readily available for from Access. Sure. Um, Alan Burrell asks, are there any credible statistics as to how many businesses were impacted by floods and how they were affected? Now, there is a document that was circulating around the Queensland Government. Um, I can get the answer to that and send it to you. It had some great stats. Uh, I can't even remember the organisation who ran it, but it uh, came out about February, and it's a really good look at uh, how many businesses were impacted by floods and how they were affected. If you would like access to that, I would uh, suggest you contact DD to get a hold of that. Um, how do you create local backup? Make a point there. Yeah, sorry. Uh, there's a document circulating, and I can't tell you the link off the top of my head. That looked at uh, the aftermath of cyclone um, or the uh, Katrina in the states, and there was a large number of companies that simply never opened again. Um, and the same thing happened in 9/11. I recall that a large number of companies there simply never opened again because they lost all of their data. Mm. Terrific, isn't it? It was really heartbreaking for those people. Um, Rob Micklewright says, how do you create local backup copies? Can this be automated? Is there backup software that will do this? Rob, I know that iDrive, which was one of the suggestions, certainly does that. There are probably others which do, but I would warn you to check out what the plan is, how much it will cost you, and how much data you're going to be backing up. If you can get a solution that's just going to back up uh, new files and those that have been amended since last, that would be the most efficient way. And you may or may not need a little bit of assistance in setting that up. Any others that come to mind in terms of the automation ones, Paul? No, in fact, a lot of the ones we've been talking about, it's not actually that easy to make it a, a local copy. Uh, because it's not part of their commercial interest to allow that to happen, to be truthful. So, sure. Uh, while I believe um, data security in these large systems is actually very high in terms of the potential, I think it's a very low uh, risk for you to actually lose data. The bigger problem is that you may lose access to data for a period of time. If you need to make local copies, then you really do have to look at the fine print because there are often, it's not technically possible, and sometimes there are commercial reasons why you're not given access to it. Sure, thank you for that again. Um, oh gosh, there's still more coming in. <laughs> we keep going. It's a popular topic, this one. Um, Kathy Reid says, does anyone have experience with live accounts? I personally don't. That's, of course, the Myob online solution. Um, I believe you could Google and find some forums where people are probably reviewing it and commenting on it and giving their feedback. Have you heard positive or otherwise um, at all, Paul? No, I haven't had any experience with that. 
Yeah, I mean, it'd be an interesting one because MyOb certainly is a popular one in Australia. It's got a large market share. But interesting to know if people do move to the live account solution. I, uh, it's because it's so new. I just, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of people who are on MyOb, but I really haven't heard about their experiences transferring over. It is interesting that MyOb have offered that um, free web service recently, and I believe that um, from the feedback they've given, that they've been uh, overwhelmed by the demand. Sure. Um, Vicky Johnson has also asked, does there exist any all-encompassing cloud computing system, i.e. financial CRM, project management and file storage, or is this wishful thinking? My comment would be that is wishful thinking, Vicky. Um, the best I can suggest is that you get these systems that do sync in with each other. That's the best we've come up with personally. And although there's been the odd one that professes to be the all-in-one, they inevitably forget one of them. So. Yeah, that might be on the horizon, who knows, but certainly not available yet as far as I know. Would that be your comment too, Paul? Uh, yes, although I think it's coming. I think the uh, third-party cloud providers uh, are able to negotiate with the best-of-breed software application developers and put together um, very attractive suites of software for you to use. That's not to say, though, that they will fully integrate. Uh, you have to be very careful. Um, I know of many cases where people have purchased various modules of software because it's all from the same company with the same brand, only to find that the software doesn't integrate. And the reason for that is that these large companies, including Microsoft and SAP, um, purchase software from other companies and then just rebadge it. Sure, resell it. That's right. That's a big part of the IT industry is just made like that, really. Um, Peter Pretorius wanted to know how easy is it to integrate various solutions, e.g. e-marketing and CRM? Do you need an IT tech to do this or can the average person manage it themselves? It's kind of a hard question to answer, Peter, because what's the average person and what's their capabilities? What's their experience with this? What's their expectations? Look, some of these cloud solutions allow you to customise to quite a degree. Some are very user-friendly and some are not so user-friendly. Um, I, I can only suggest you perhaps give it a go yourself, and if you're finding you're not getting anywhere, then perhaps to get some help on board. Um, but, you know, you've got to do the time versus money thing too. If your time is valuable and better spent in other aspects of your business, you may see fit to just outsource it straight off. Um, Gemma Wright's also asked, any suggestions for sending emails to large numbers of people? At present, I seem to say 40, then again to another 40 and so on. Gemma, um, there's many e-marketing solutions out there. One I often recommend to people is MailChimp.com, mainly because you can get up to a thousand contacts on there for free, um, and then you start paying. So if you're dealing with quite small numbers like that would be deemed, you can certainly segment databases and send them to just a few at a time, or do a big broadcast to the whole lot. And at the moment, that's my favourite because they're innovating in regards to social media the most. Any other comments there, Paul? Yes, I say you, you have to be very careful about bulk emails. And the reason is it's one thing to have some software that will do it for you, but many of the ISPs will actually block um, if you send email, too many email too quickly. And so you'll find that you'll actually get on the ISP's blacklist uh, if you break their rules. Now, I've been involved in some um, ISPs in Australia where their rules are extremely restrictive and that if you send sort of, you know, as, as little as sort of 20 or 30 or 40 emails over a few minutes, you're seen to be spamming and you're on their blacklist. So you, it's not so much can the software do it from the point of view of sending the email, you need to be very sure that there's a strategy in place that the emails will reach their intended recipient. Sure. I think we are going to have to wrap up here because we've gone quite over time, but I hopefully everyone's appreciated. We've done our very best to answer these questions. Um, I'd like to thank you very much, Paul. You've been a wonderful help and contributing some really valuable comments and experience on today's call. Um, I want to make you all aware that we do run these webinars quite regularly, so if you've enjoyed today and you've got something out of it, here's a list of other topics coming up which you might find useful too. The next one, Search Engine Optimization, on Wednesday the 11th of May. It's also a lunchtime session. These are all recorded if you ever can't make them, by the way, but you'll get the most out of them if you get on the live call because you can, of course, ask the questions. Um, financial management coming up. 
that's a big one for a lot of businesses getting on top of those finances. New local search marketing. If you have a, a target market of particularly local, maybe a doctor, you're a massage therapist, you've got a retail store, etc., that would be a brilliant one for you, and certainly tourism would also suit that one a lot. Financial management and planning, these are all free, and you can register at this website. Maybe you even want to go straight from here and register and secure your seat. Um, if we haven't answered your question, or there's something we've said, Didi might be able to help you with that, here's the website, business.qld.gov.au. They have an extensive amount of information on there, templates, tools, resources, downloadable workbooks, and so, so much more. Go on and have a look and help your business in the process. Otherwise, you can always ring the business hotline, 1300 363 711. They will either help you there on the spot, or they'll put you in touch with somebody who can. And once again, I'd like to thank uh, you for getting on the call today. I know your business time is precious. I know you're straight back from your Easter break. And if you're anything like me, struggling to get back into it a little bit. But um, thank you for getting on the call. And we would really like you to give your feedback. Part of our contract with Didi is actually to get uh, uh, responses so that we can enhance these and make them better every time. So please respond. We'd much appreciate it. We hope to see you on the next call. And once again, thanks so much, Paul. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We'll catch you next time. Muted.